Well, good morning, church. Before we get officially started here, I want to make you guys aware of a few things we've got going on because it's all, it's it's summertime. Like we're in, in the middle of summer. It's almost July. A lot going on. The best way to kind of keep up with what we've got going on is to download the Church Center app and find us on there. Just you can scan the QR code, head to your app store, download Church Center, find us on there through Northeast, and you're going to stay up to date with everything that we've got going on uh, through there. But not just that, you can meet us at the Welcome Center. It's right out here at our lobby. We'd love to get you connected as part of our church and just to welcome you here. Um, not, it's also very important that you guys make sure that you go and grab your communion and bring that in with you. If you forgot it, go ahead and stand up now and go grab it. But there's also some notes out there that we want you to take notes this morning. Terrence is going to help us uh, really figure out how to share the gospel this morning. And he's got some really great notes to take. So make sure you go and grab one of those. And we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Hi, welcome to Northeast. We're so happy you joined us today. We've got a lot of great things happening in our church, but with so much to keep track of, you might have a few questions, such as, how do I volunteer? How do I find community? What is a stakeholder? I mean, doesn't that guy burn his hands? Are Blitz Days all about football? Is that why you have a playbook? How many light bulbs fit into the Jesus is why wall? What's the deal with all the semesters at, or trimesters, third trimester, is that right? Which one's Corbin? Which one's Trevor? Are there memberships? How do I get connected? There's puppets? Why are there pillows on the floor? Where do I park? What is a scribe tribe? How do I solve this? Where's Wall Street? Street? Group Connect? Tell you what, why don't we just start with the basics? Northeast Basics is a four-week course that meets during the 11 o'clock service, and we guarantee that all your questions will be answered. Even this one. Sign up for Northeast Basics today.
Oh, good morning, Northeast. How's everybody doing so far? Okay, that was a lot better than the 9 a.m., but we still got a little bit of work to do uh, this morning to kind of wake up. Uh, My name is Jacob, and I'm one of the youth pastors on staff here. We've got an incredible morning uh, ahead of us. You know, last week, Terrence, he kind of started things off in this series called How to Be a Witness, where, you know, in Scripture, a lot of times, especially for those of us who are Christians in the room, we receive the good news, we have life change, we get baptized, but then, honestly, we leave it at that. We maybe are in church community and we participate in all the stuff, but then we don't take the gospel and share it in every avenue, in our home, our city, our workplaces, schools. And that's just not what scripture has in store for us. That's not exactly what Jesus has in store for us. He says that we are to be witnesses, to hear and see what he has done in our lives, but then to go and share it with those around us. Okay, people who are close to you, but far from Jesus. And so that's uh, why we kicked off this series is to help you guys out with that. Uh, Last week was a lot about the why. This week is a lot about the how do we do that? Because let's be honest, sometimes having faith conversations can be a little awkward. Sometimes we make it weird or someone else makes it weird. So we're gonna gonna have a good conversation about this uh, this morning. If you missed it out at the doors, I, I, I will give you permission to get up and go and grab some of the notes for this morning. Uh, They're on the tables right by the entrances. I highly recommend you go pick up one of these because like I said, Terrence is gonna give a lot of practical tips on how to have gospel conversations in every er area of your life. Now let's do um, something just to kind of get get us started, get us doing our favorite thing that we love to do at church on a Sunday morning. Let's practice talking to one another, talking about Jesus to one another. Let's go ahead, let's stand up to our feet. Let's say hi to someone and welcome to Northeast. Worship with us as Shay leads us in this first song. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy.
sing about his faithfulness this morning. Sing this with me.
Would you guys pray with me? Uh, Father, that is truly our prayer. That as you have been faithful to us, help us to be faithful to you. God, we just admit in this moment, uh, at least for me, just the so many moments where I fall short of that. And so, Father, we just want to acknowledge your faithfulness to us. No matter what's standing in front of our way, no matter what stories or, or, or people or just obstacles are hindering our faithfulness to you, God, I ask that you just remove those this morning. Help us to see you for who you are, how good you are, and that you're a faithful God. God, we love you. I'm going to say all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. We just want to continue this time of worship now through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. You know, sometimes we can just see like the music moments of a church and worship services as that's the time for worship. But man, the scriptures talk about giving our whole bodies as a sacrifice. That is true and meaningful worship. And this is one of those moments. You know, you can give uh, today uh, by giving online or visiting the, the boxes out in our lobbies and Man, this is, a, this is an impactful moment where you can be intentional with everything that God's already blessed us with and return it back uh, to him, for him to bless it, increase it. And I just want to take a moment as um, the youth team lead just to say thank you for being such a generous church. It, it's, it's truly incredible. Like all, obviously with all the things with our, uh, our city impact, our, our Love the Ville outreach, it's incredible. But man, what you're doing for us as the next generation is pretty impactful. 
You know, as we turn the corner into July, tomorrow, right? That's insane to think about. Um, There's a lot going on for us as a youth and a kids family ministry team. We have so much happening uh, this July that I just wanna share a little bit. It's just the one that you're in the know, but then invite you to pray with us and just to kind of hear these stories about where your generosity is going to and how it's affecting the next generation is pretty profound. Um, Here in just a few weeks, um, our middle school pastor, Catherine, is going to take a small group of middle schoolers up to Indianapolis to partner with YouthWorks, where they're going to kind of take this Love the Ville outreach mindset to Indy and work in community shelters, clothes distribution centers, and kind of learn how to really live out this Love the Ville DNA. It's going to be really incredible. Then I get the great honor, uh, along with a few of our other adults, get to take a group of high schoolers, about 15 of us, to the Dominican Republic at the end of this month in partnership with Go Ministries. Man, this was an incredible trip for us last year, life-changing trip last year for all of those who were there. What's really spectacular about this trip in particular is that out of it, our youth, man, they started to lead Bible studies in their school, started to lead and kind of um, influence the, the gospel in so many different areas of their life because of that trip right there. Uh, but not just mission trips and learning how to live uh, this Love the Ville lifestyle. We have two incredible camps coming up in July. One is our kids camp where our uh, fourth through fifth graders are headed to Country Lake here in about a week and a half. And then literally a week from today, we are hopefully about an hour into our journey with our high schoolers. We're taking over 100 high schoolers to Daytona Beach uh, to Passion Camp where we, uh, yeah, amen to that. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Um, where we are going to hopefully have all these encounters with God uh, to grow our small group community together, to have incredible, profound worship moments that they come back a week later changed, transformed into the image of Jesus and what he's done for each and every one of them. So there's a lot to be praying for. There's a lot to be excited about. And what you and your generosity is doing uh, to change the next generation, to be a generation for Jesus. And I just want to challenge you in this moment that, um, especially for beach camp, uh, set a reminder. Literally, you can pull out your phone right now and set an alarm or a reminder for one o'clock. Go ahead. I'm I'm being very serious. You can go ahead, pull out your phone, set that reminder for one o'clock. And you could just say it, uh, maybe say youth or next generation and things like that. And I want you to set up that alarm to pray for them. Uh, We've challenged our parents for beach camp to set an alarm uh, for this at one o'clock, at one o'clock, because all it takes is one moment with Jesus, one encounter with him, one prayerful moment, one leader just speaking over their life, one message in in these moments like this, one conversation for their whole life to be changed. So will you join with us? in praying for the next generation and what July has in store for us. So thank you, church, for your generosity. Let me pray over all of this right now. God, I just thank you for a church who truly embodies generosity. God, it's been so beautiful to see what you're doing in our city and God in the next generation. I feel so humbled to be just a small part of leading the way in a lot of those areas. And so God, we just wanna offer up our gifts. We wanna offer up our time. We wanna offer up our abilities to you. And Father, we ask that you just multiply it. We ask that each and every one of these mission trips, we ask for these camps, for them to be truly transformational. God, that they have just one moment of a deep encounter with you so that way the rest of their life is changed and they learn how to be a faithful witness. They learn how to be uh, confident of their stories so that way they return home and want to change their schools, their sports teams. Maybe they even challenge their parents in their own faith. So God be with them. Give us wisdom. God, we love you. We ask all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Well, speaking of how the next generation is truly impacting um, and making a difference, you know, we're in this conversation right now on how to be a witness, and today is a lot on how to be practical, how to really share your story, how to really be confident of what Jesus has done for you, so that way you could share that with those who are close to you but far from Jesus. 
And I told the team, I said, hey, we've actually been talking about that as a youth ministry for about two months. And I've got about 30 students who have gotten in front of their peers and their friends and shared their stories already. What if we had one share them in front of the church? And so that's what we're gonna do today. And I'm, I'm so excited for you to hear this young man's testimony. And I ask that you, as you just listen, maybe take notes. How, how, does it, how is it similar to yours? But maybe as you hear his story, learn how to share your own for your job, in your home, for your family. So would you guys please do me the honor in welcoming one of our graduated seniors, Josh DeGrella, to the platform to share his story with you all this morning. Well, good morning, church. Like Jacob said, my name is Josh DeGrella, and I'm a student here at Northeast. Over the past couple weeks, Terrence has led us through how to be a witness, and so I'm really excited to have this opportunity to share my story with you all. So I grew up in an atheist household that was always accepting of other religions. But unfortunately, by the time I got to middle school, I already had hurt without even stepping foot inside of a church. My closest friends at the time misrepresented Jesus in a way where I didn't feel like I belonged. I would try to reach out to God only to feel nothing. I was so blinded by my own desires and false sense of reality. I was expecting someone or something that wasn't God. I thought he'd be the instant solution to all of my problems. And so at this point, I was planning to be a devout atheist my entire life, proudly proclaiming against what was said to be the truth by so many people around me. I thought I had it all figured out. But then high school rolls around and we're in the midst of COVID. I began to find my identity only in being a good student, an almost decent basketball player, and a skilled video gamer. After doing that for a while, none of them were truly life-giving. I started to long for a greater and deeper purpose. I was asking those same questions Terrence was talking about last week. Who am I? What was I made for? And does my life really matter? And so sophomore year of high school, God sent me a miracle. After somehow, through everything, everything aligned perfectly through unlikely circumstances, um, I went on a school trip to Costa Rica with my girlfriend, where I met my girlfriend, Rachel. After the first couple days of horrible shyness and awkwardness, we would spend nearly every second together talking about life, our interests, and faith. Not only was she the most beautiful girl I had ever seen, but she was so bold and passionate about her faith. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced. She wasn't afraid of what I thought of her, and she wasn't ashamed. She spoke to me as if she'd known me a lifetime. And so she acted with such gentleness, love, and kindness. Church, that is how we should be sharing the good news. And since then, Rachel baptized me in May of last year. Um, and I've had the privilege of baptizing two really good friends and amazing guys. I've also found a heart of servitude here at Northeast, uh, becoming really involved with the worship team and the middle and high school ministries which always leaves me in awe of how God works through a unified community coming together in his name through song. Church, bold Christians make bold Christians. That's the first step. Boldly spreading the good news of Jesus is where we must start if we wanna reach the hearts of those with layers and layers of hurt and pain. And I found that those who truly and genuinely love the Lord with all their heart tend to love others with a similar kind of love. Be the person that won't shut up about Jesus because you love him so much. And church, y'all gotta realize the power of your story. Don't get so caught up in whether or not your story is special enough or powerful enough that you get in the way of that potential life-changing and life-saving moment for the person sitting next to you. No matter where God has placed you or where he has led you, church, we need disciples like you going out and boldly preaching the only truth there is. Know that God is with you wherever you go, whenever you go, to the ends of the earth and to the end of the age. Thank you. What more can I say? It's as simple as that. Let me tell you, if a graduated senior from South Oldham High School can do that, so can you. 
so can you. At 17, 18 years old, he's already baptized two friends, and it was all because of someone being faithful to the good news and shared it with him. We all have a role. We all have a responsibility. Let's take up yours. We're going to learn more about that in just a few minutes. But and speaking of also, too, the, just the next generation and our church wanting to just disproportionately invest in the youth, we've had four interns uh, kind of join us for the summer. And one of them by the name of Sarah Allen, who she's a senior at Johnson University studying preaching and leadership. Uh, she's actually going to help us center our minds, center our hearts before we take communion this morning. So would you go ahead and welcome her onto the platform as well? Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning again, Northeast Christian Church. It really has been such a blessing to be with you guys this summer. Uh, Thank you for your generosity and hospitality. You have some awesome leaders at this church, and they didn't make me say that. I really do mean it. They're great people. Well, I am neck deep in wedding planning right now. Uh, Me and my wonderful fiance are getting married in 41 days, but who's counting? Not me. Um, We're really excited. We're really excited. But For any of you in this room who have planned a wedding before, you know how stressful it is. There's a lot of of moving parts. Got to get the right color flowers, all the right people. It's stressful. And Thursday night this week, I stayed up really late, (laughs) stressing about all the different things that has to come with a wedding. And when I stress during the day, I stress at night. So all Thursday night, I'm tossing and turning, didn't get much sleep. And I wake up Friday morning, just not, not in the best mood. Wake up on the wrong side of the bed, but life goes on. I roll into work Friday morning, and Claire, one of the other interns, and I are set to go serve at one of Northeast um, partners. It's called UP. It's a homeless ministry that serves women and children here in the Louisville area. So Claire and I drive to downtown, and we're, we're serving these young women and children coffee and snacks. And something I notice that God meets me in this moment is these women and children have bigger smiles on their faces than I'd had all morning. They're saying remarks like, thank you so much for serving us, we're so grateful. God bless you. And I'm sitting there going, you're the ones that are serving me, honestly. We have so much to be grateful for, we really do. And yet we forget, I forgot. These women served as a perspective shift for me. My priorities were out of whack. I think communion can do that for us too. It should serve as a perspective shift for us. Jesus died for us, Jesus died for our sins, his son on the cross, and yet we go about our weeks forgetting. It's a human thing for us, do we forget? I forgot. And so my my prayer for you this morning is when you take communion, you don't forget. You don't go about your week forgetting what this means. This isn't just juice and bread, it represents something. Let us not forget. This is his son, died on the cross for us, his body and blood represented for us. So church, let's take the bread. And let's take the juice in remembrance of him. Let's spend a few moments reflecting on what this means. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for another Sunday morning. Lord, thank you for bringing all these people in this room at this one time. Lord, it is no mistake that we are all here. Thank you for your intentionality in that. Lord, thank you for the unifying sacrament that we get to take together on Sunday mornings. Thank you for forgiving us because we do forget, Lord. Lord, let let your son's sacrifice serve as a perspective shift in our hearts. Lord, forgive us, forgive our sins. Thank you for loving us. Lord, let us go throughout this week and just remember and live in the freedom of your son's death on the cross. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. took communion and tried to talk, it's real hard. My mouth is really watery right now. That cranberry juice is good, man. I gotta, I gotta figure out the distributor and, you know, get that in my fridge. <laughs> All right, before, before we hop in, um, want to give a quick announcement. School Blitz is coming up. How many of you served in School Blitz before? Raise your hand. Awesome. Awesome. School Blitz is just an amazing thing that we do where we take church out into our community. I think we're now up to about 34 partner schools that we show up and we do beautification, we prayer walk. And I think this year we're going to be blitzing some teacher lounges and we're just going to be doing some amazing things to love on the schools in our community. Um, and here's what we believe. We believe every time that we go out and we do gospel uh, demonstration, we believe that there are opportunities for gospel conversations down the road. As we earn the trust of administrative teachers, leaders in our community, we want to be number one on their Rolodex. So when issues rise up in the schools, they think we should call Northeast because they will step towards these things. And we want to be a faithful people to do that. And so if you haven't signed up for Blitz, please sign up. Go to the Church Center app. I think we're over 200 people already who have signed up. But just don't show up here on that day because you will be here by yourself. All right, and we will be out serving. I think we're going to be partnering with other churches in the community. It's just an amazing thing of church unity and service in the community. Now, before I hop in, sometimes, you know, you go to church and you're like, we could just go home. I feel like this morning, man, after the testimony and after communion and after the worship, we can just go home. Too bad we not, all right? <laughs> but to hop in, we're going to be in week two of this How to Be a Witness series, and if you weren't with us last week, we kicked off this series and set our heart in Acts 1, verses 7 through 8. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and watch, uh, not just because I preached, all right, but I encourage you to go back and watch because we spent a good amount of time just talking about this call to go to be witness for Jesus in a pretty in-depth way, and today we're going to build on that. So to reset us, I want to read that scripture to us, Acts 1, 7 through 8. Here's what it says, and this is Jesus talking to the disciples before he ascended back into heaven until he returns again. But here's what he said. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when I hear that passage, and maybe when you hear that passage, that sounds simple enough, right? But what we've come to realize is that uh, this simple command to go has really tripped the church up historically. So I shared this good news stat last week. Show me the good news. 71% of Americans have a positive perspective of Jesus. Praise God. Like, that should get us excited. That should give us some eagerness. Like, if we don't want people to just have a positive perspective. We want them to have a positive encounter with Jesus, right? So that should get us excited. But at the same time, there was some bad news on the other side of that. Give me the bad news. The bad news is that 28% of non-believer Americans have a positive perspective of Christianity, and only 26% of them have a positive perspective of Jesus' followers. Yikes. That's a big difference, 71 to 28, 71 to 26. You've heard it said here before that when people think of church, they think of something. And likewise, when people think of Christians, they think of something. One person may hear Christian and the church and think bigots. That's a popular one in society today. That's one that is getting written about a lot where some bad actors of the faith go out and they try to represent us and they say and do things that we know Jesus would never sign off on. Or maybe there have been some people who go out with zeal, but they haven't really been discipled well. And out of their eagerness, they go out and they just make mistakes and sometimes those mistakes hurt people. Sometimes people hear Christians and the church 
And they think abusers. Maybe they just saw an article come across their feed of another pastor or another volunteer in the youth department that did some heinous thing that, that breaks their heart, that breaks all of our hearts. These people that were entrusted uh, to lead spiritually use that power and authority to take advantage. Or maybe these were people themselves who experienced such heartbreak. Maybe they grew up in a faith community and that faith community created an environment that left them vulnerable. And those stories break our hearts. Maybe somebody here is Christian in the church and they think hypocrites. Maybe they came to a service like this one day and they heard a message that inspired them to say yes to Jesus for the first time because they were promised not only an eternal hope, but they were promised an eternal family that would meet them right where they are, that would journey with them in love, that would hold their hand through the sanctification journey and give them a space to grow in deeper understanding. And they took that community up on this offer. And maybe they showed up one day to the home group or to the small group, and they decided, today I'm going to take my mask off, and I'm going to share vulnerably from my heart. But the problem was everybody else in the group kept their mask on. And what that person received on the other side was shame and disappointment. They felt alone, and this hope that they attained now feels lost. Or maybe this is somebody who grew up in a Christian home. And their family showed up to a church like this every Sunday. They made them go to every youth camp, but for some reason, Monday through Saturday, they lived like hell. And that kid grew up asking questions of, hey, God, how could we attend church so much? How could my parents pray so much? How could they do so many of these things of service but still live in such a way that sounds and looks so different than what I read in your word? And they came to the conclusion that all this is a sham. And so when they come to face to face with another Christian or they hear the word Christian, they just scoff and say, not for me. Yet, in between all of those negative connotations, I believe are beautiful ones. I believe there's friend and helper and servant, kind and loving, because we still manage to get 28%. <laughs> See, perspective is a choice, and in this circumstance, I believe perspective is a blessing, especially in a world, as the Bible describes in 1 John 5, 19, as a world that is under the control of the evil one. Or what about 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that says, the world that we're in is blinded in unbelief by Satan. To do what? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What 28% tells me is that despite our brokenness and despite the bad theology that has stuck around in the church, despite the bad actors that claim Jesus but don't know him, and despite the schemes of the enemy to keep people blind, the gospel still goes forth and, and storms the gate of hell and still makes an impact in a dark world. And we want to be a people that join into that 28%. And so, as a church, this series is about our commitment to do that. I want to take us back to week one. I gave an invitation or in a challenge of sorts, and I think, hey, if you came back for week two, you accepted the challenge. Praise God. So, so here's the invitation. The series invitation is this. Accept the call to be a prepared witness for Jesus, willing to use words right where God has you. A, uh, a, a quote from a book that helped inspire that call was from Preston Perry. He's an apologist and an evangelist, uh, but he recently wrote a book, How to Tell the Truth, about evangelism and apologetics. And here's a quote that he had in the opening chapter. He said this, the moment someone knows you're a Christian, you become an evangelist. And the moment they ask you a question regarding your faith, you become an apologist. Now, I gave definitions. Here are the definitions of evangelists and apologists if you want to write these down. By the way, I hope you grabbed the note sheet. This is a note-taking sermon. Like, there are going to be a lot of notes to take, so take out your phone. But I want you to take notes. This is, a, this is an opportunity for you to leave here equipped and more confident as a witness. 
So maybe these definitions are going to help you uh, as you journey. But, but here's the first definition. As an, ev- an evangelist is someone who testifies to the good news of Jesus and the Christian faith. So this is somebody who intentionally uses words to testify about Jesus and speak to the good news of Jesus. And an apologist is someone who defends the good news of Jesus and the Christian faith. So this is somebody who uses words to, to defend and, and, and to, to stand firm in the Christian faith. Like for us, it should, it should really bother us when people go out in the world and, and they proclaim Jesus in such a way that it's not consistent with Scripture. It, it should really make us upset when, when people ridicule our God and, 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 and throw him out there as if he's something that he's really not. So we should be a people eager and ready when the opportunity comes to defend the true God in all of his love and all of his grace, but also in all of his righteousness and all of his holiness. But today is about being an evangelist. Now, being an evangelist is a, is a funny thing. It can trip you up a little bit because, like, right now, some of you in this room have the gift of evangelism. So if you go read through your Bibles in, the, in 1 Corinthians and other places, the Bible talks about how we all have spiritual gifts. And one of the spiritual gifts that exists out there is just this gift of evangelism. There's some of you in this room that just like, it burns you up every morning to just get up and go talk about Jesus. And don't nobody have to beg you. You don't need Terrence to beg you. You, you already doing it. You just in here doing like this. Mm-hmm. Yep, I do that. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Like, that's inside of you. It it has never been a scary thing for you to talk about Jesus. And typically, when you go to talk about Jesus, people tend to like you. That that usually means you have a gift of evangelism. Now, some of us in the room are like, I ain't got that gift. I got the gift of, like, administration where I'm in the back room, and I'm like, I'm doing the stuff that nobody sees. I'm the the behind-the-scenes disciple. You know what I mean? Like, there's some of us in the room that really have that gift. Uh, There's some of us like, "I, I like to be hospitable. I like to cook for folks. That's my gift. I like to bless people and say, hey, God bless you. That's, that's my gift. And listen, that's great. Some of us have the gift of encouragement. Some of us have the gift of discernment. Like some of us have these different gifts that, that God uses all for his kingdom. The issue is, is that irregardless of what gift we have, we all have received a call to go. And so the challenge for us is to not only live in our gifting as we see it, but to ask the question, how does my gifting help me go? See, I'm not, I don't think I'm naturally an evangelist. I just think whenever I came to faith, it was, it was attached to the gospel presentation. Like whenever I was uh, saved in college, th- like they immediately told me that I should go tell other people that I was saved. Like, hey, you just said yes to Jesus. I want you to think of five people that you need to call and tell about this life-changing moment in your life. They immediately challenged me to go and be an evangelist. And so it's always just been a part of who I am. And I know for some people that wasn't a part. So we want to attach that back to this calling that you have as followers of Jesus. And going and being an evangelist for me hasn't always been a successful thing. The very first time I tried to share my faith with somebody who I love, they didn't talk to me for six months, all right? The issue was I tried to share my faith through text message. Terrible. Don't ever, listen, I was, I was being a semi-coward. Like, I was like, listen, I can text this and they can do what they want to with it. And that's exactly what he did. He did what he wanted to with it, all right? And he was mad at me and didn't talk to me because he, I, he couldn't see my face. He couldn't see the love in my heart. Like, this was real concern, not judgment, all right? And so I learned never text, you know, a, a bridge diagram through your phone. Like, that, that, just don't do that. But there have been other times where God has uh, really blessed it. So, you know, where I feel this call to be an evangelist is uh, when I'm getting on the airplane. Oh, my goodness. No matter what, if I'm flying somewhere, I'm walking through Louisville Airport, and it's like, you know you got to share your faith today. I'm like, no, I don't. I feel like I'm like, they, I just seen the new... Uh, uh, Venom uh, c- uh, commercial for the movie coming out where he's kind of talking to himself. I'm like, that's what I feel like I'm doing when I'm walking through the airport. You know, you got to share Jesus. Mm-mm, I ain't doing that today. <laughs> I'm flying to Dallas. That's it. <laughs> and so this last time, about a month ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to get out of this. So I downloaded the movie. I downloaded Beverly Hill Cops. I was like, you know what? They got a new Beverly Hill Cops coming out and I need to be prepared. So I need to watch all, all the Beverly Hill Cops so I'm ready. And so I was like, I already got my movie, Lord. Too late. <laughs> so I get on the plane, and I'm sitting there, 
And I'm like, all right, got my movie started. I'm getting comfortable. You know, I'm like, all right, here we go. And I just feel this nudge in my spirit, like, don't be disobedient. So I'm like, Lord, please. Like, I do this for a living. Like, can I please just fly? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, here we go. So I look to my right, and the dude beside me is already like this. And I'm like, that ain't my dude. All right, I ain't talking. <laughs> Definitely not talking to him. All right, I might get taken off the plane. All right, so I'm like, all right. So I look across the aisle, and I see this young fella. He, had his, he has his headphones on, but I notice that he's reading this book. He's picking it up, and he's putting it down. He's picking it up, and he's putting it down. I'm like, I feel like I know that book. I've seen that book somewhere. And so I'm like, all right, here we go. So I reach across the aisle. Ta -ta -ta. What you reading? He's like, huh? I'm like, what you reading? He's like, oh, it's this book, um, What is the Gospel? I'm like, here we go. I was like... <laughs> I was like, I know that book. I think that dude's from Louisville, man. Like, I read that book before. I was like, what you think? He said, there's some good stuff in here. And so what ended up happening in this conversation was that this guy was a young believer, and he was trying to sort things out. And here he gets to sit beside this pastor for two hours who gets to help him sort these things out. <laughs> and I said, praise God for obedience. For God, you allowed this to be a moment of blessing. Now, the reason I had a little anxiety is because the last time I was on the plane, Flying into Louisville, I had a great conversation with this dude. I mean, we talked. I got all the way to the gospel presentation. I answered his objections. I mean, we had a great conversation. And I said, man, well, we're landing, man. I would love to keep talking. Can I have your number? He said, absolutely. Dude gave me a fake number. <laughs> Broke my heart. I was like, man. This whole time, I was like, man, I, I don't want to be a weird dude, so look, this is going great. He was like, this is a weird dude. <laughs> but and so as I was processing the rejection I received from this guy, I found solace because my training had, had given me a right theology around evangelism. And I just want to share the three verses that trained me in evangelism that I think will help you. The first one is one that you already know, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It's the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's foundational stuff as a believer. All right. As we're going, we're called to go. We're just, we're just people always on the go. Uh, the second verse that really helped me comes from Ephesians. Um, and this, this scripture here was about understanding our role as believers. Now, when I received this training, I wasn't a pastor. I was just a, a faithful servant in the church. I was just serving on the usher board at my church. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a pastor or anything like this. But I, I received this training, and here's what it says. It says, the one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip who? The saints for the work of what? Ministry. To do what? Build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity with a stature measured by God, I mean, by Christ's fullness. Man, number one, that's just a beautiful picture of, of who we should be becoming as a church, right? It's just, just a beautiful thing. But at the same time, as I sat and I received this years ago, I was almost attacked by the reality that I had been living my Christian life expecting my pastor to do everything. They're the ones that are called to proclaim and preach because they're the pastors. And then Paul wrote, no, 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 no. Their job is actually to equip you to be the preachers and, and the leaders in the community. So that's actually a good metric for you as you attend this church. Uh, are we equipping you for the work of ministry? When you come here, are you feeling like I'm leaving better equipped to go out and do the will of God in my life? I hope the answer is yes. But what it also invites you into is to the reality that the work of ministry gets done through you. Jesus is why we are the how. That was a good challenge for me. The third scripture that helped me understand all this was understanding God's role. Found this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Here's what it says. What then is Apollos? 
What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but who? God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. I love that scripture because it reminded me that when I had a great conversation with the young man who was new to faith and the guy who gave me the fake phone number, the measure of my success was that I chose to be obedient. Now, I fought tooth and nail, but I came out on the other side obedient, and I began to rest and understanding that in both of those circumstances, whatever growth would happen in those people's hearts, it would have to come from the work of God. And so now I get to show up and be evangelistic without thinking, without thinking that it all stands on my shoulders. See, that can trip us up sometimes. We can think about this work of evangelism and think, I, I, I have to seal the deal. If I don't seal the deal, if this person ain't coming to 9900 Brownsboro Road next week, getting in the water, I didn't do good. <laughs> and it's like, that's not the measuring stick. The measuring stick is willingness to obey our Father in heaven who has given us this ultimate mission. And we get to ask ourselves, did I do the next thing God invited me into? The second thing I love about that passage is that it actually reminded me that like when we stand before uh, Jesus one day, we're actually going to have uh, two judgments. So if you notice at the bottom, it talks about being judged by your own work. So what, what has happened in, in the history of church sometimes, people get that scripture and they, are, they attach that to salvation. We know that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone through his finished work on the cross. We are secure in faith because of Jesus. But this also points to the fact that when we stand before God, we will be judged about who our advocate is, but also what you did with the life God gave you. How did you multiply your life? That second judgment determines the, the type of blessing you're going to receive on the other side of this life. Now, our heavenly theology, there's a lot of mystery around that, so I'm not the dude to sit down with and explain to you exactly if the rolls are really going to be gold. Like, is it real gold? Like, what carrot? Like, I don't know. All right? Like, I remember when I first came to faith, I was like, that's all cool. I just want to get in. Like, long as I get in, I can be on the edge of heaven. I'm in. Right? right, Like that was always my position. But then I just got challenged to say, well, well, that is a low goal because God has invited me to receive all of his fullness. He's, in, he's invited me to receive all of his blessings. So why not live a life pleasing in his sight so that I might receive all that he has for me? And that's my encouragement to you. Now, there's a quote that I love. Uh, if you've never read The Master Plan of Evangelism, it's kind of like, to me, the manual of having like an evangelistic heart and the theology of evangelism. It was written by uh, Robert Coleman years ago, The Master Plan of Evangelism. Write that down and go order that book. It's a short book, easy read. You will be inspired by it. But, but here's, here's what he shared, and I think what he shares here agrees very much with the passages I shared. He's talking about the disciples' uh, disposition, the way that they looked at evangelism and depending on the Holy Spirit. Here's what he said. Uh, evangelism was not interpreted as a human undertaking at all, but a divine project which had been going on from the beginning, meaning the garden, and would continue until God's purpose was fulfilled. It was all together the Spirit's work. All the disciples were asked to do was to let the Spirit have complete charge of their lives. And church, that's our invitation. To allow the Spirit to have complete charge of our lives. When I, when I think about that, I think about words like this. Let go of my life and let God have his way through me. 
When I think about that, I think about how one of the men who discipled me in my life, how he would challenge me. We would sit down and I would be asking him questions about uh, situations in my life or even when I got into ministry, I would ask him questions about uh, what things I should do in ministry. He'd say, Terrence, here's a prayer that I found helpful that I think you should pray. God, where are you at work and how can I join you there? And that's my encouragement to you. Every day, wake up and pray that prayer. God, where are you at work and how can I join you there? Because you know what that does? That reminds us that when we show up somewhere, God didn't show up just because we showed up. See, so often we can go on mission trips so we can go to start serving in hard to reach places in our city, in our community, and we can think, because I'm showing up, God is now here. And God is like, I already been here, Joker. You here to join me in my work. But what it also does is it frees you from feeling like um, you have to be somewhere that God is calling you to step away from. Because there have been people that have stayed places way too long thinking that if I leave, it's all going to fall apart when God says, again, the work I started, I will complete. Not the work you started. So our theology has got to be straight as we walk towards obedience. We have to be praying the right prayers and asking the right questions. And let's start with looking for God where he's already at work. Now, praying a prayer like that is important because when we encounter people, we're going to encounter people at all stages of their life. So we've shared the Ingle scale a bunch of times here on Sundays. Let's throw it back up. So here's the Ingle scale. And the angle scale is this tool that just helps us understand all the different places somebody might be as we encounter them with the gospel. See, what we get obsessed with is number 10. All right? I need this person to make a decision today <laughs> to surrender to Jesus. And you know what? You know why we go there? Because that is one that has a tangible metric. It actually has proof that what we did works in some way or somehow. This is why it feels so good to get the grass cut and just do this. Like, I don't know if I, I, I'm pretty sure if you look out in your windows, you, whoever cuts the grass in your house, when they finish, they all stand and look at the grass like this. It's just something, you just have to do it. I don't know, but I feel so good. I hate it when I get out there. It's hot. I got a weed eat. I'm doing all this stuff. But when I get done, I'm just like, wow, oh, man, look at this beauty. So sometimes when we leave somebody to faith, we can kind of almost want to stand and say, look at what I did. And the angle scale reminds us, again, that you are there typically watering work that God has already been doing. And so it's important for us to know through discernment and through prayer and through asking good questions where somebody is because they may not be ready for a gospel presentation. Like maybe the nature of my relationship allows me to actually do this conversation over a few weeks. Maybe I only have about 30 seconds with this person. And so me getting all the way to a gospel presentation might not be. Maybe they're on the plane with me. And I know, okay, God, you are actually giving me a captive audience. I probably can go full speed right here and get right to the matter. It's just understanding what people are because when you understand what people are, it helps you contextualize the gospel to meet them right where they are and watch God work. And here's what I believe. I believe uh, Colossians 4, 2 through 6 helps us in understanding how to do this. So this is our focus passage. I know we're a little bit in the mess, but could you stand for me as we read this focus passage, if you can stand? It's in Colossians 4, 2 through 6, and here's what it says. It says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word. This is Paul. He's writing from prison, asking for an open door to preach the gospel, not to get out of jail. To speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Bless the reading of God's word. You may be seated. So what we find here is really, in my mind, a blueprint to help us have gospel-centered conversations 
and what I believe would be the right way. And so what I have for you on your note sheet, if, you, if you're taking notes with me, we have uh, four principles. Let's walk through these four principles. The first principle is prayer. The first thing that Paul says is devote yourselves to prayer. And so what I believe in this passage is inviting us to is to, to number one, have prayer as a daily practice. We should be those weird people praying everywhere we go, praying at the grocery store, praying at the pickup line. Lord, please let these kids come out here. Not ashy with, they, with, they, with the shirt I sent them in, like all the things you can pray. Be praying at the ballpark as your kids are playing. God, would you just open up doors of conversation for me? But just have a, a, a devotional life of prayer because as you have a devotional life of prayer, you're learning how to abide in Christ. You're learning how to stay connected to the true vine. And as you stay connected to the true vine, you begin to look like the true vine, talk like the true vine, think like the true vine. And before you know it, you have an impact like the true vine. The second thing is we should be praying for opportunity. Paul models this for us. Paul is in prison, and he is saying, pray. Hey, while y'all are praying for y'all own opportunities, pray that God would give me some opportunities. Paul is like, listen, if I'm in jail, ain't nobody sleeping tonight. I'm preaching until the sun comes up. Somebody getting saved in this jail if I'm in here. That was Paul's mindset. And you know what? What would it mean if we had that disposition? Long as I work at this place, somebody getting saved. Long as I'm selling insurance, they're going to get some insurance and some eternity. Right? There's opportunities all around us, so we just need to be praying for those opportunities. There's, there's a difference in hearing a message like this and leaving and saying, well, God, if you put somebody in front of me, I'll be obedient. You know what? God would rather you pray, I believe. I believe he would rather you pray. Hey, God, as I go out to eat, would you put somebody in front of me? There's a difference. And I think if we pray a prayer like that, God will be faithful. The third thing we should be praying for is praying for discernment. We just need more discernment in how we're interacting with people. You know, sometimes, again, we need to know the angle scale. We need to know how to ask good questions. We need to be able to read body language. We need to know uh, the type of answers people are giving us as we have conversations. Because sometimes people are just not in a good place for us to be holy rollers in their life because that's how they're going to see us if they're in the wrong disposition. And so we got to have discernment to know how to answer people appropriately, how to keep our words gracious, how to have words that are seasoned with salt. And then the fourth thing I think we should pray for is we should be praying for our own hearts. We should be praying for our hearts because every time we go to evangelize, every time we go to share Jesus, there's a potential for rejection. And rejection doesn't feel good if it's a stranger or somebody you've known your whole life. And the issue with rejection is rejection can begin to write a narrative for you if you're not careful. We can begin to let rejection be our story, or we can begin to let rejection be our excuse. And so this is why I think Paul says, uh, devote yourselves to prayer and stay alert in it with what? Thanksgiving. Which leads me to my second principle, desire. Thanksgiving will move you to have a desire to do the will of God. A couple months ago, I shared about doing uh, life from religious obligation from, uh, versus from Christ-centered um, gratitude. Let's look at the obligation cycle. So if you begin to go out and share your faith from obligation, what's going to begin to happen is the, you're going to go out and share. The enemy has schemes, so I guarantee the very first person you try to is going to be like, get out of here. And then you're going to be like, you know what? I should have never done this. I went to work and talked about Jesus. Now I'm in HR. Talk, go on it, Terrence. <laughs> now from that resentment, you got wrote up. You're on a work plan. Now you got entitlement. I already faced my persecution. Hey, it's somebody else's turn now. I don't did my part. So the next time you hear the evangelism message, you're like, I got war wounds, man. I went to HR, all right? I did my part. And then what you create for yourself is a cycle of escape, where these simple calls of Jesus, we just get to say, you know what, I've done enough. But gratitude does something different. Let's see the cycle of gratitude. From a place of gratitude for all that God has done for you, from living your life in a place that says, God, I see how you've kept me. I've seen all the things that you've kept me from. I've seen the deliverance I've experienced in a midnight hour when I was on my face praying that you would change a situation and you did. 
God, I see how when I thought I couldn't go any further because you didn't change the situation, you still were good. When I get to live from a place of understanding how much God has kept me, I begin to live from this reality that even in the hard times, it wasn't me that pulled my bootstraps up. Because if it wasn't for God that gave me the strength to pull my bootstraps, I wouldn't be here. And so I live from gratitude. And then from gratitude, I get to walk with encouragement. I get to remind myself daily of the joys that it is to be called a child of God. And as a child of God, I'm low to the ground because I know I don't deserve that title. And so from from this sense of gratitude and from this sense of humility, I'm going to walk and be a blessing to somebody else and experience the blessing of obedience myself. Two totally different stories. But the difference is praying and staying alert in the scriptures and in the God's word and in prayer with thanksgiving. The third principle I have for us is opportunity. Here's what I know. Opportunities are everywhere and all around us. Every day in our life, there are opportunities to be uh, witnesses to what God is doing in other people's lives. Now, we can get overwhelmed with all the opportunities, so I just want to give us three types of opportunities. So write these down. These are three types of opportunities I would encourage you to start looking for. The first are moments of intersection. These are moments uh, where people are going through what I would call life-altering seasons. Maybe they just lost a parent. Maybe they are all of a sudden now a widow or widower. Maybe they got laid off. Maybe the house got foreclosed on. Maybe they're going through something so difficult, and they're asking deeper questions about the meaning of life, about human suffering, about hardship. These are amazing opportunities for us to show up in people's lives and be a beautiful witness of Jesus. Now, can I, can I caution you? These are not times to show up and say things like, well, God needed another angel. That's terrible. Strike that from all of your vocabulary. You don't need to walk up and say, well, everybody has their time. What? That's very insensitive. Let's, let's, let's not do that. Don't even walk up and say, you know what, it must have been God's will. You don't know people's theology. You don't know how they're wrestling. You know all you need to say? I'm sorry. And I'm here if you need me. You don't need a special scripture. You don't need a devotion. You don't, you don't, you don't need anything. Maybe a casserole. <laughs> Maybe a pie. But I'm sorry. And I'm here if you need me. And the caveat to all that is to actually mean it because some people will take you up on that. They actually may need you to come cut their grass. They may actually need you to pick their kids up from school one day. They may may actually need you just to come sit with them. And you don't have to have special words. Your presence under the power of the Holy Spirit that Scripture promises us will create the right words and the right things to say in those moments. The second type of moments we should be looking for are moments of interruptions. This is when somebody interrupts your life. Like, this is when the salesperson shows up at your house. I I get excited about these. I'm like, yes. All right. So, like, this is when you're just sitting around and somebody shows up and they're like, hey, have they told you about the new fiber optics in the neighborhood? I'm like, fiber optics? What are those? (laughs) I'm just real excited. So, I'm going to step out and talk with you. My, My whole... This is my caveat to any salesperson. I will listen to your presentation if you listen to my presentation. (laughs) Nine times out of ten, they say yes. This just happened not too long ago. About last month, I had a young man stop by the house named Braden. Braden was selling security systems. He actually had a pretty good security system. I'm like, it's pretty good. All right. It was the worst time. I'm cooking dinner. My kids are running around crazy. Like, my daughter was potty training. I'm like, don't, 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 this is not how she normally is, all right? <laughs> she just came to the door like that, all right? So I'm like, my wife is in here, so I'm going to just step out and have a conversation. So we sit down at the picnic table outside of our house. That's, that's a good thing I would say, hey, put a picnic table in front of your house. It just invites people to sit down. Um, but we sat at the picnic table, and we had this conversation, and he actually, I was like, hey, okay, that's good. Uh, and I started asking him one by one little questions to get intel on his life. Found out he was from England. Um, he was here for six months on an internship. He was going back home to, uh, to start his own business. 
and that he was religious in his own right because he grew up uh, as part of the Latter-day Saints community. If you don't know the Latter-day Saints community, that's the Mormon community. Now, from, from our perspective, from Christian orthodoxy, we would not consider that to be congruent with biblical Christianity. So we would believe that we have a different faith tradition than them. Um, and so for me, this was an opportunity to just get more intel on where he was in his journey. I found out that he was still, he was in the process of questioning his faith journey because he re recently watched his parents go through a divorce. And now he was really struggling with reconciling good works because part of the, the Mormon community is a lot of good works. He was really reconciling, doing all the good works and the goodness of God. All this happened in 10 minutes. So what I did and what I felt in my spirit was this. God placed on my heart to share with him Jesus' words of, come to me all who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. And that's all I shared with him. And here's what I also know. I haven't done much uh, research on, on their community, but here's what I know. When people are really nice to them and they kind of feel a, a strong sense of love or affirmation, they count that as a little miracle. And so he was like, this is a little miracle in my life. Can we take a picture? This dude took a picture with me, sent it to his family and his friends. He's like, this dude just talked to me. And I said, hey, man, I got one more thing for you. I ran in the house. I got him a book. I said, hey, read this book. This book really was impactful to me at my age. When I was your age, I think it might be to you. And here's what you need to know. It's hot out here. So if you ever get thirsty and you're in my neighborhood, you can stop right here. If I'm home, you can come in. I'll get you water. You can sit down. Well, he came back in like 10 minutes because it started raining. <laughs> I was like, I said, it's hot. No, you know. Kind of crossing the line, no. But he came back and we sat down. It was a great conversation. I text him once a week. And my goal is to get him to at least have one coffee or lunch with me before he goes back home. That's it. He hasn't said yes yet, but he texts me back every time. And I pray for him and I send him scripture and I say, hey, man, I still want to take you to lunch. Very simple. I didn't do anything special. Just was hospitable. The third thing is to have look for moments of integration. These are moments where your life integrates with somebody else's life. So you go out to eat and you have a waiter for the next hour. Your lives have integrated. Airplane, we best friends for three hours, all right? Little League, we're going to be showing up to the same field watching the same kids for the next 12 weeks. Our lives have integrated. And that helps you think of strategy and ways and the people that you can begin to share with. When I go out to eat and I feel a sense that the waiter has time to kind of stop and interact with us, my goal is usually just to get to a point where I, before I leave to say, hey, hey, we're Christians and we believe in the power of prayer. Is there a way that I can pray for you? Never has anyone told me no. And most times they start crying. And then we all put our hands on them and we pray with their permission. Don't just put your hands on folks. <laughs> with their permission. And then we try our best to leave a good tip to say, hey, you were just blessed uh, by us financially in the way that we hope that you will receive God's blessing for your soul. And we go about our day. All of those are opportunities to plant water and watch God work. The fourth thing that I want you to write down as a principle is nuance. Nuance is so important. When I say nuance, I mean different flavors for different people. There are intellectual barriers. There are emotional barriers. There are familial barriers. There are cultural barriers that people face as they encounter with the gospel. So the uh, Barner Group did a, a study and they surveyed non-believers and they surveyed Christians and say, hey, what are reasons that make you doubt and what are reasons that make you dismiss Christian, the Christian faith? And here's what they found. It was all the same thing, just in different order. Uh, hypocrisy, suffering, science, conflict in the world, and a pluralistic worldview. Those were the same things that tripped up non-believers and caused believers to doubt. And here's what I found. Sometimes when you're sitting with somebody, they literally have a logical uh, block between accepting the gospel. And we have to be people that don't have to know all the answers, but can go find the answers. We just got to be people who can research and help people. That's the first one, intellectual barriers. The second is emotional barriers. Emotional barriers can be based on circumstances. Hey, I need my bills paid. My pressing need is blocking me from hearing you talk about my spiritual need. So sometimes we have to be willing to be generous to get to a spiritual conversation with people. Sometimes people have familiar barriers. Again, familiar barriers have a lot to do with the family of origin that people are coming from. Sometimes people come from faith traditions and backgrounds uh, that 
practice things like uh, uh, where, they, where they disown you for changing your views. And so sometimes there are people who you will encounter that grew up in like a cultish community that really want the gospel, that really want Jesus, but they're so afraid to lose mama, daddy, brother, sister, auntie, uncle, cousin, because they don't know anything else. And we have to be patient with people, willing to journey with them to help them see that this new family they're being invited to is more than sufficient. The fourth is cultural barriers. This is one that was kind of popular for me in college that I struggled with. That was actually a, a year, my, that was actually a time of my freshman year where I struggled and I wrestled and I started studying and looking up, you know, uh, uh, ethnic-based religions like the Nation of Islam and things like that. And uh, one of the biggest barriers for me from a cultural perspective that I believe that Christianity was the white man's religion. How did I come to that conclusion? Well, I grew up going to church, and every picture of Jesus was some white dude. But then when I read the Bible, they're clearly in the Mediterranean. How is this dude that pale <laughs> in the Mediterranean? Don't make sense. Don't make sense. And all I needed was a cultural moment to happen that dealt with race to attach to my skepticism of the faith, and I was out. And so I had people who were generous with their time and generous with their patience. They helped me understand church history and how some of the things that have been normalized in church are wrong. And that all because all the cartoons you see are of white people don't mean that that's actually what those are just the creators expressing based on their own tradition, who they are. They're drawing people how they look. Understand. I said, like, that makes sense because when I think of Jesus, I think of a black dude with dreads. <laughs> that makes sense now. But really what I needed was somebody who was nuanced enough to journey with me to help me see the true God of the Bible. And that's who we want to be. On your note sheet, I got something that I will leave you with as your homework. This is something I want you to go home and study over the next week or two to prepare yourself to go out and be a witness and just to start gospel conversations. But before you go home and study that, I want to give you five reminders that are going to help you. And what this is, is how you get conversation from being about somebody's ball cap to being about Jesus. Here's the first thing you need to know. I want you to look for topics with spiritual implications as you're funneling the conversation. World events, things that are happening in society, be looking for those things. Number two, you need to transition well. Always be transitioning well. Be thinking about where the conversation is going. Don't just be aimless in the conversation. Number three, be blunt and open. If you're going to share the gospel, share the gospel. Don't beat around the bush because you might mess around and share a fake gospel. So share the gospel, be blunt and open. Number four, cause you to use open-ended questions. Don't just say, do you go to church? Say, hey, tell me a little bit more about your, your church background. Now they got to talk. You want to get people talking about themselves so that you can get more intel to know and listen for the spirit to lead and guide the conversation. And then number five, I just want to encourage you to count the cost always. Uh, every time that you are obedient to share your faith, there is a cost. Jesus said, if they revile me, they might revile you. And they crucify him, hey, they may crucify you. But Jesus also says, carry your cross anyway, and you won't have to worry about any of it. But, but count the cost. Sharing the gospel changes the relationships forever, good or bad. Last thing I want to give you as I close is just an invitation to come join us for our workshop, How to Be a Witness. Again, it's going to be on July 7th at 6.30. We got 32 or 34 people signed up for it. I'm excited about it. We got room for more. Come join us. We're going to answer your questions. We're going to get you equipped. We're going to make sure you know how to go about doing this the best you can, at least on a basic level. Last thing I have for us is our series commission. So I just want to give this commission, and then I'll be out of your way. Comes from... Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Church, that's our commission. God, we thank you. You're worthy of all praise and all honor. And so we just ask that you would just make this the reality for our lives, God, that we would just be faithful witnesses wherever you called us to go. 
I thank you and I pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thanks, Terrence, so much for that practical wisdom. Guys, if there's anything I can just remind you of, just head on out to our Welcome Center, and we will get you signed up for that workshop. It is something that you, it's just going to be full of practical wisdom, and just like what Terrence shared, so that way we can be confident and faithful witnesses in every sphere of our lives, and that's our prayer, is that you go and leave this place and be a faithful witness and go and love the Ville this week. We'll see you guys next week. I will praise as long as I